All right, we are here with Quincy Larson from Free Code Camp. How are you doing today? Rock and rolling. How about you? I'm doing great. I just want to do a quick video with you, uh, just talking about full stack development and how to get a job in that field. What does it take to to know the front end for full stack web development? Well, I would definitely recommend learning the fundamentals, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Those have all been around for around 20 years. They haven't fundamentally changed that much. JavaScript is getting better and better every year as uh, you know the ECMAScript uh, committee piles on additional features. Uh, JavaScript started out, of course, as just like a, a basic browser native language created in a week. Yeah. <laughs> what I can tell you is JavaScript uh, is under an incredible amount of research and development right now. Microsoft working hard. They've got TypeScript, which is typed JavaScript. Uh, of course, Google and Facebook are investing heavily in JavaScript and just propelling it forward as fast as they can. Uh, and then learning platforms like FreeCodeCamp have basically adopted JavaScript as the main learning tool, uh, the main technology to learn everything in. Because in my opinion, it's the most versatile scripting language. It may not be as elegant as Python or Ruby, but it is faster in virtually every case. And it's getting faster all the time, thanks to uh, all the R&D that's going into it. And you can it's, it's the only language that is native to the browser. So you should absolutely spend a lot of time learning JavaScript and, and learning it really well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just, just a question I got for you. So when it comes to front end, how much of it is HTML, CSS, and design versus JavaScript and React or Angular? Uh, what, what do people focus on with all these different options? It's, I mean, you can do one Google search and, and be overwhelmed for, for days with material. <laughs> my, my opinion is that, uh, you know, functionality always wins out over form to some extent. And you don't need to worry as much about making a page look aesthetically beautiful if you have a library like Bootstrap that, that has some sane defaults. You can focus on what components you actually want to show, what you want the user to actually be able to do. And you can always bring in uh, somebody with more design sensibilities who can, who can uh, take a hard look at your CSS or, or create a, a custom look for your uh, site and you know do all the color theory and, and the typography and all those other things that go into aesthetics. Uh, I would recommend learning some of that stuff on your own. And if you go through the free coaching curriculum, you'll learn some applied visual design. But uh, we spent 95% of the time fo focused on mm -hmm. actual functionality yeah. as opposed to form. So uh, just to make sure the audience is clear, the HTML and CSS is the design, and JavaScript is like the, the functionality of, of the front end. But one thing that's really cool about JavaScript is you can also use it for back end development. Yeah, so with the back end, a um, few years ago, uh, a guy named Ryan Dahl decided he wanted to get JavaScript working on the back end, and he took like the Google V8 engine and he basically added a file system to it and some other things like that. And bam, Node.js. And Node.js at the time, people were like, why do we need this? It's like, it's, it's not even like threaded, right? Like it's basically a single thread. It can only do one thing at a time. But what we found out is that it scales incredibly well. And if you use like functional programming and some other paradigms like that, uh, you can get insane performance out of Node.js, like mm -hmm. way better than you get out of a you know, a lot of traditional scripting languages uh, like, or, or web development frameworks like, yeah. like Python, Django, or Ruby on Rails. So it's a really fast language, and it has the biggest package ecosystem in the world uh, in history. Not only can you do back-end development with JavaScript, but increasingly it's the default way that somebody will create, uh, you know, an API for their for their mobile app or, or for their, their web app or even Internet of Things stuff a lot hmm. of times with Node.js. I really emphasize making sure you understand the data layer. Can you explain what kind of databases you recommend or what kind of stuff you cover in the free code camp curriculum? So I think that uh, you can do a lot with a database without really understanding how it yeah. works. <laughs> uh, you know, they've got object relational mapper tools. Uh, every major web development framework has them uh, for 
Node.js, one of the more popular databases is MongoDB, which is a NoSQL database. It's can you document explain? store. So, okay, so document meaning you know the the rows aren't all the same length. Right. Basically, you can just have a giant blob <laughs> of stuff. Like for example, uh, in, in uh, FreeCodeCamp's database, uh, we have the user object, and sometimes it's megabytes, <laughs> yeah. um, and it's just a single object. Like it's not related. Like we we dump a lot of stuff into it, and yeah, it could definitely be construed as an anti-pattern, but hey, we were in a hurry and it works. I mean, we awesome. have millions, millions of people using it. So, you know, when we hit billions of people using free code camp, that may be a bigger issue. But right now, uh, using MongoDB seems to work well. So in terms of like, if you really, like if, if you have time, I would definitely recommend learning uh, SQL and learning how traditional relational databases work because it's absolutely fascinating and very useful if you're doing like high performance stuff, uh, and it's just extremely versatile. If you have Postgres, if you have MySQL, uh, you can do so much stuff with those databases that would be much harder to do with a non-relational database. What about source control? How do we manage all of this code? Now there may be some legacy systems that are still using tools like Subversion, oh, yeah. uh, Mercurial, <laughs> but a vast majority of version control today. It's done with Git, and the reason why it's done with Git is because it's really well written and well designed. Linus Torvald, the same guy who created Linux, created Git because he wanted to have a, he wasn't satisfied with the options out there. He wanted he just created his own. Um, pretty well built. A lot of the commands are kind of counterintuitive. Uh, you're gonna be googling a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Git is the version control system. You just you know install it on your local machine, and then you can commit to Git, and you can put you can have your own private Git server. If you want to have like a more high-touch featured Git server, you can use uh, what's called GitLab, which is open core, not truly open source. Open core is where they open source part of it, but they have a proprietary uh, aspect of it. It's kind of their secret sauce that justifies them getting all this venture capital. So <laughs> GitLab is a good tool you can use for that. And then GitHub is the most prominent place where people will push their code. And so they push the local code that's in their local version control to GitHub. And on GitHub, other people can view their code and they can download it themselves. They can make changes to it. They can push it back up and they can say, hey, I've got a fork of the code and I want to merge my code into yours. So like, I've made these changes. I want to commit them back to the original project. This is the foundation of open source software where anyone on the internet can download your project, make some improvements, and then suggest those changes back to you. Right, and so that's that's why many people, including myself, refer to GitHub as the center of the open source universe. Yeah. Because pretty much everybody's on GitHub, pretty much every major project is on GitHub, and so it becomes this de facto collaboration ground for all that. Now there's also Bitbucket, which is, is great. It's owned by Atlassian. And uh, there are a few other places, but really, like it, GitHub is probably an order of magnitude bigger than anybody else at this point. So once we have an understanding of the code and how we control this with source control, how do we go about building some good projects to, you know, start to build a portfolio and make ourselves marketable? Yeah, there are a ton of different project ideas out there. FreeCodeCamp has published like these lists. The, the title of one article is every time you build a to-do list, a puppy dies. Um, because people joke that like there's even this to-do MVC, which is basically this website that they build the same to-do list and all these different model view controller uh, you know, frameworks and stuff, and you can see how they're different and look at the code and everything. So the to-do list is like the most universal kind of like phoned in lazy project idea. Hmm. But there are so many other great project ideas. Uh, so we, you know, we have that whole list. Free Code Camp itself has dozens of different projects that you'll complete as part of earning the six different certifications. There are also like West Boss has his JavaScript 30, which has 30 different projects you can build that are all really cool and fun, um, and then just a ton of different lists of projects. I think on GitHub, like awesome project list. But if you Google that, you'll probably find something like that. So. There are so many different projects. What I encourage you to focus on is not what to build, but how to build it. 
you're you're the engineer you're trying to figure out how to make this a reality what to build is more of a business decision that your bosses are going to decide for you or your product manager or you if you're building a startup project but uh in reality you're going to be listening to your users they're going to tell you what to build right in that situation so you never really need to worry about what to build worry about how to build it just grab some project any project start building do you think contributing to open source is a necessary requirement for all new developers I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but I think it's a great way to immediately get exposure to the developer community and get people looking at your code. Uh, I mean, you could absolutely just build your own private portfolio and probably get a developer job based on your strengths. But if you want to be able to collaborate with other developers, especially with a remote team uh, where people are working at different times in different parts of the world, open source is the best simulation that and you can get that for free. You can get free code reviews. You can get free critiques from world famous developers just by contributing to their open source projects and seeing what they say about your code. And of course, if they accept your code, that's quite a badge of honor if you've contributed to Linux or Firefox or even free code camp, other major open source projects. So go out there and contribute to open source. It's definitely a good use of your time. So let's say people have a pretty good understanding of the technology now. They, they got the source control and they're contributing to open source and building a portfolio. How do people go about learning the, the fundamental knowledge for interviews, such as data structures and algorithms? What do you recommend? Interviewing is a completely different skill set from actually developing software. Uh, the interview process is heavily skewed toward you know recent computer science undergraduates. So asking the kinds of like questions about data structures and algorithms that uh, you would have gotten in your undergraduate. Like if you take the Stanford algorithms course, it's like a two part course. And it's, I think it's on like edX or, or Coursera, just Google it. They, they may have put it on the, they have their own online course platform now, but that will definitely give you a very strong foundation in algorithms and data structures. And honestly, like 90% of technical interviews that they're going to have you go up to a whiteboard and, and talk about how to you know flip a, a binary tree, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, if you have all those data structures down pat, you're going to be in a very good position. You can also do Cracking the Coding Interview, which is a great book uh, that uh, my friend Gail wrote. Like she's up to like edition seven or something. At this I actually, point. I actually share this book a lot with my viewers. So that's, that's cool. That you bring it up. I could actually uh, leave it in the description for you guys to check out. I, yeah, I have it right over there. <laughs> it's a great book. And uh, another thing that uh, I would recommend, of course, free code camp, we have hundreds of algorithms uh, that you can solve and, and data structures that you can build with tests and everything uh, in the interview prep section. Awesome. So are there any last tips for a full stack development career, what people should expect or what they should strive for? Aside from getting all the technical expertise and just practicing a ton, you are going to want to build kind of a, a thick skin <laughs> when you're applying to all these places you're going into interview. Uh, you're going to need to be used to rejection. Don't be surprised if you encounter difficulty and rejection when you're applying for jobs. Most of these organizations are very risk averse and it's much the, the consequences of them hiring the wrong person are much worse than the consequences of them passing over a person who would have been a good fit. So they, they are much more concerned of, about uh, false positives, uh, so to speak, yeah. people that they shouldn't have hired. So as a result, they're going to interview just a ton of candidates for every individual person that they hire. So just know that, it really is a numbers game, um, and I would encourage you to just keep at it, apply to hundreds of companies. And this is not just like spam out your resume. This is like seriously go through, do some quick research, and figure out whom you need to contact, how you can apply. And like just plan to spend weeks, months of your life applying for jobs and interviewing. And even after you get a job offer, keep going. By the time you start getting job offers, that means that you – have a lot of, uh, the people are interested and the more job offers you can get, the more you can use those as negotiation tools to uh, secure a higher wage. Don't necessarily accept the first job 
uh, mm -hmm. comes to you, just plan to spend a lot of time and energy and it will definitely pay off. You can leapfrog where you would be if you just spend a little bit more time on the job application process and if you keep interviewing a little bit past your comfort zone. So I appreciate you joining us, Quincy. If you could just let us know how we can connect with you and hopefully we can do some more content with you in the future. Yeah, sure. Just follow me on Twitter, uh, twitter.com slash O-S-S-I-A, Osea. Um, and I only tweet stuff that I think is going to be worth your time. Thank you. And uh, see you all in the next video. Cheers.